welcome everyone to the Marion Sims Sloan Center. My name is Natalie Burgess. I'm a faculty member here in the English department. And it is my pleasure to put on events like today, which is part of our writer's reading series. And I just want to kind of get an idea. How many of you are in our classes here at Long Beach City College? And then I know, OK, wonderful. And then I know I have a handful of visitors coming to us. So welcome. Um, we always like to share our space with um, people from the community because sharing the written word is so important. And I'm honored to be able to do that today with our opportunity through the Writers' Reading Series. And it wouldn't be able to happen without our Long Beach City College Foundation. And we have a wonderful new director, Elizabeth McCann, who works closely with us. So thank you to the Foundation for supporting our efforts. I want to make a few announcements about some upcoming events that you can look forward to. Our monthly open mic night is, um, we have one more scheduled for this semester. It's going to be November 18th, so two Fridays from now. Sign up start at 645, and the events go from 7 to 9, and have everything from poets to short stories to music. So if it's your first time reading in front of an audience, I would uh, offer that it's a very welcoming and supportive audience, and so it's a good space to put your work out there, especially if you're a first time reading. And then I also want to announce we have one more author event in the Writers' Reading Series this semester. Don McKeon will be here on Friday, the 22nd at 1.30 p.m. And all of these events can be found on our web page. So now I'd like to do, introduce Professor Jason Kassam, who's going to come up and introduce our author. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming out. Again, I want to thank the uh, Long Beach City College Foundation for, for making uh, activities like this happen, especially for, su for supporting you know, our creative endeavors in the English department. Uh, I was a student here at Long Beach City College. I was a student in Professor Ian's fiction class a long time ago, earned my AA here, and in 2007, I met Mike Buckley and we met at Long Beach City College in the NFA program. So we've been friends for almost a decade now. Uh, we met in the, in the program, and we we just we disconnected. I think Mike once um, after a night uh, after a night of workshop and the post workshop workshop uh, at a bar uh, sent me an email saying that we were uh, we were uh, uh, soulmates, you know, so uh, ready soulmates. So ever since then, uh, we've we've had a, we have a connection, and, uh, and we understand how to. We, we, we agree and we understand a lot about how to put stuff stories together and we you know we've always supported each other uh, with our with our with our teaching and with uh, with writing. Uh, I admire Mike's writing. I admire his writing whether I'm reading a science fiction story about a uh, about a robot ninja or uh, or uh, some kind of realist uh, some form of realism what what I admire about his writing is no matter what type of writing uh, you know, I'm reading from Mike, there's always a connection where my heart hurts. Um, and most importantly, at the end of a lot of his stories, uh, it asks me, it asks me uh, to check to see whether or not you know, I can be a better person. A better person, a better man, and that's the connection that I love about, about Mike's work, whether it's sci-fi, fantasy, or realism. Mike's a, uh, he's, he's, he, he's, a, he's an avid writer, he writes every day, but he's also a working writer. He, um, and we talk to our students a lot about this, uh, what happens after programs, uh, when, you, when you leave writing programs, you know, what are you faced with and challenged with keeping up as a writer? And, I mean, that was one of our concerns when we were in MFA, you know? Can we sustain that type of writing uh, we're pressed to write every day. And I don't know if it's magically, but Mike is so disciplined that he writes every day. And he's never given up that, you know, the, the creative process and, and, his, uh, and his, his ambition to be, to be published. Uh, he's been featured in uh, the American, the American series, the Best American series. Uh, he has been published more than once in Clark's World. In 2011, his uh, collection of short stories on Internet came out. And um, I, just, uh, I think Mike uh, is a great writer for, for students, especially our students, because he is, uh, he's down to earth and he knows, he knows, uh, he understands uh, the struggles that 
students and working students uh, deal with on a day-to-day -day basis uh, in trying to balance the creative process with, I guess, with reality. Yeah? So uh, put your hands together for my friend, my brother.
and, uh, and feel free to, uh, to ask me anything about publishing, about writing, um, about agents, about uh, you know, science fiction, about, about realistic fiction. Um, ask me just general questions on life, and you know, fair warning, I'm not as good with those. I would like to be kind of vague. But, um, but anything that you, that you want to interject is completely fine with me. Um, so I'm going to read from my short story collection, Finish Your Man, from 2011. Um, and I want to read for a while from a story called Yoshimi and the Robot, which is, is very much a, for me, a Long Beach story because it, it well, it takes place in Long Beach, but also, uh, um, for me, the, um, the over by sort of Marina, Marina Vista theaters, or Marina Pacifica theaters, the, um, uh, PCH and, and where those those salt marsh areas are with the with the oil refineries and whatnot, that is kind of where this takes place for me. Like I I, I grew up here and so um, you know my friends and I used to go out there sometimes sneak out there and, and find like all this just you know like old abandoned rusted like stuff. It was like I I I, I love the the idea of that stuff being you know out on this you know very expensive land and 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 just sort of left to itself like. I love the idea of a salt marsh mixed with an industrial wasteland. <laughs> kind of a weird idea. Um, anyway, so this story is called Yoshimi and the Robot. Yoshimi's vast potential for robot killing was first discovered by her gymnastics professor, Dr. Adekai. You are quick, Yoshi, and strong. I see in you all the makings of a great robot killing karate. And he was right. At the RKK tryouts in downtown Long Beach, Yoshimi surpassed every other hopeful in speed, ferocity, and smile wedge. At the end of the afternoon, Wexworth saw the greatest sensei in Long Beach and a hero of the robotic conflict regarded the crowd of contestants. The tryouts were meant to fill two vacancies in the city's team of robot killing Karaktos. A recent skirmish near the salt marshes had resulted in one death and one flipped off arm. Two personal friends of Stahl's were off the team, and he was loath to choose two new Karatos. But even in his dark flower, he could not deny the obvious superiority of Yoshimi. You, step forward, he said to her. You are chosen to train for the team. And um, Stahl scanned the shining faces. As far as he could tell, they were all the same, hopeful and mediocre. At random, he pointed to a moonlight face. You, he said. Excellent work. Step forward. And thanks to everyone here for offering to help in our endless war against the robots. These two will get the chance to train with us. Names? Yoshimi, she said, eagerly. Stencil, the moon face said. He did not look happy. <laughs> Stahl congratulated the two again and slouched back to the scarlet dragon print tent that followed him around. Yoshimi turned to Stencil and put her hand upon his shoulder. Have you ever seen a robot? She asked. The war between man and robot has raged for ages, was how Stahl began his lecture on the first day of training. Yoshimi and Stencil sat before him, each in crisp running suits. Wexworth himself was clearly hungover. He had spent the night before drinking highballs and wrestling with his bow constrictor. As you know, he continued, the robots are programmed to do us evil. Fortunately, much of their technology is frozen at a mid-1950s level. Stahl continued on with everything the students needed to know about the robot-human conflict. It began back in the mists of time, perhaps 25 years ago, when the robots mercilessly turned upon the human creators. It was a dire betrayal, and Wexworth himself had seen pictures of humans in double-breasted suits sharing coffee cake with robots. And it was well known that human kindnesses were again and again rewarded for body and cruelty. They made their city in the ruins of the oil refineries that lie on the far side of the salt marshes. Day and night, the oily housewives of southern Long Beach could hear the robots building more robots, attaching and testing buzzsaw hands and roaring in their strange language while testing clampers and clippers and defenestrators. They attacked once or twice a month when their complex evil plans came to fruition. Only one weapon was proven effective, karate fighting. The specific mixture of violence and backflips, chops and rooster calls seemed to dazzle the robotic brain. The raging karate wars that span the salt marshes were the stuff of legend, and Yoshimi glowed as she heard about them. 
stencil plate with shoelace. Let's get that one going. That night, they ran off. Yoshimi ditched the stencil and went to the salt marshes. It was, of course, forbidden. The land was frequented only by robots, karakos, and flocks of dirty seagulls, but Yoshimi couldn't resist going. She had learned so much that she felt very safe as she warmed up, and doing lotus stretches near the reeds that marked the beginning of the salt marshes, she stifled a giggle. The barest traces of dusk still hung over the marshes, and she made her way very carefully through the 50 meters of reeds. The ground was soft sand, and once or, once or twice it tried to grab her shoes in a muddy suction. Beyond were dwarf palms, planted years ago in the pre-war excess, and also rusted oil derricks in various states of profile and prayer. Yoshimi hadn't imagined that the salt marshes would be so peaceful. There was a very gentle scent of the sea. She came upon a flock of seagulls, perhaps 500 of them, at rest in a field of churned sand. Yoshimi stood still and watched the birds. Suddenly as one, they burst into flight. The noise was horrible and the birds created their own strong wind which stung Yoshimi's eyes and moved her hair. And then they were gone, a wide black mass in the sky, leaving an empty field before her. I wonder what scared them, she thought. She was sure that it wasn't her. Yoshimi strained her eyes, looking across the field. Her heart kicked her in the sternum. She could see something moving at the edge of the field, its eyes glowing, faint and purplish. Yoshimi crouched down and watched. There were no other robots that she could see, and even though Stahl's voice warned her, don't be a fool, Yoshimi, Yoshimi crossed the field. The robot did not seem to notice. It was acting strangely, rummaging in the low bushes, shuffling like a miser. She approached with an attack distance, just under 10 feet, and left erect. Huzzah, she said, and the robot turned. Yoshimi flashed a dizzying array of hand signs. This technique was known to fire up the robot's cerebral vacuum tubes, forcing it to flip through punch cards to decipher the meaning of the hand signals. Yoshimi flashed these signs, a peace be, a Vulcan live long and prosper, an English schoolboy salute, a Girl Scout honor oath, and a war flag from the gang known as the Trail of Crips. The robot chuckled and boots, computing the visual, the visual inputs. Now was the time to strike, Yoshimi knew. A side kick to the neck could decapitate the thing, or maybe a power chop, or head scissors. And then the robot signed back to her, a peace be, which had been reversed to a British fuck you. <laughs> Yoshimi stared in amazement. This had never happened before. The very fact that the robot had human-like hands instead of automated cleavers or spike pinchers was remarkable. And here, it was signing. And then it spoke. Ole, it said, in a deep <laughs> metallic timber. Yoshimi had just met a robot called X8A8. He'd been born in section 1712 Omega, or in human terms, just to the left of the abandoned smokestacks, where the conveyor belt spit out a robot, well, spit out new robots at the rate of two a day. If forced to say something about himself, XA8 would say 010010. Or to translate, I feel that there is something profound in the universe, something that, something that understands me even though I do not understand it. It was typical of x 8 to say something philosophical like this. In fact, of course, he was correct. The robotic race had a curve or central understanding receptacle, which collected, collated, categorized, and channeled knowledge to all robots. It chose what to pass on, necessary knowledge only. And 8A8 regularly received information about humans intruding into the no man's land of the salt marshes. There were flaws in the system, though, and the robot had received snatches of music from Kerr, bits of television broadcasts from the human world, even offers for real estate seminars and sexual performance enhancers. <laughs> All of these came to him like surreal revelations, pointing at bizarre complexities in the human world, 
closed circuits of culture, unproductive expenditures, rash beings at once quite robotic and quite illogical. 888 often watched the other robots as they loitered around the ruins of the refinery, waiting for a human to wander into their sights so they could hamstring our robo plan or auto spank him and wondered, is this all there is? Am I forever doomed to the banality of evil programming sessions? The snatches of song and image he accidentally received via curve of the human world felt like sustenance, like acknowledgement. This was what brought him to the salt marshes. It was a contemplative place, the low light that glowed a very gentle purple in his thermal vision, the old oil derricks that stood like drunken cousins. But he couldn't help his programming. Despite going to the marshes out of curiosity, despite his desire to meet a human, the robot wanted to destroy them as well. One doesn't just take off five years of evil programming like an unfashionable suit. But then Yoshimi surprised him. She appeared in his vision like clusters of heat bound together by cord. The strange hand signals were confusing. He'd heard stories from other robots and wondered, are they trying to communicate? Is it a threat? Kerr had the greatest robotic minds busy deciphering the implications of the hand signs, but it was pure philosophy to the robot until tonight. He responded in kind, then spoke the word he'd heard in a salsa commercial he'd intercepted. <laughs> A word he hadn't translated and felt meant hello, I love you, let's dance, and sky at the same time. Ole, he said. Graduation and status as true robot confrontation technicians was only a week away. Stall up the tempo of training introducing cheetah roars and disco shouts into the panoply of kiosks that Yoshimi and Stencil could use, introducing savage biting techniques meant to sever robot loop lines and revealing a secret weapon to bend the robot's antenna, warping his connection to Kerr, the equivalent of kneeing him below the belt. This intensified pace took its toll on Stahl. His emotional state had suffered lately due to some romantic disappointments, and he had been drinking a lot. One morning he woke up, a glass in his hand with a sip of whiskey left in it and his boa constrictor lying in front of him, waiting for the dawn to come through the glass wall that was Stahl's pride and joy so it could resume the wrestling match it left off the night before. He knew that it wasn't healthy. It was one day watching Yoshimi axe kick a combat dummy that he fell in love with her. He couldn't explain it himself. He had known women who were more beautiful, the kind that awed most Karakos. But Yoshimi made him feel something much like tenderness. It was a feeling that he hadn't had for anyone or anything in a very long time, except maybe his bow, whose black eyes turned his heart to putty. At about the same moment, through the human mystery of our own curve, maybe God or pheromones or pack thinking, stencil fell in love with Yoshimi. He felt deflated looking at her, an empty skin next to her flamboyant kicking and kiyaping. That night, as Stencil and Saul tried to come to grips with their feelings, Yoshimi returned to the salt marshes. She had resolved to kill the purple eyed robot. Somehow she knew that he would be there where he had been before. The reed beds concealed her approach, and she crouched by a dwarf palm to spy on the robot. And sure enough, he was there, staring out over the same grounded flock of seagulls, deep in thought. The robot turned when she was within a few feet of him, preparing to strike. His perceptiveness surprised her, but more surprising was the oily-looking panel on his chest. It was difficult to make out, but then she saw him gesturing. It was the sign of the dawn. Yoshimi got closer. The robot signed dawn again, and she saw what it was on his chest, a mirror. As he signed dawn, she saw her face reflected in his chest panel. She was confused for a second, then forgot all thoughts of killing him, and only wanted to understand the robot, his history, and his mind. They spent the rest of the night there, Yoshimi and the robot, signing to each other, and eventually waltzing in the sand next to the seagulls, which this time did not fly away but slept, beaks under their wings, standing on one foot. 
The graduation ceremony fell on Wednesday. Because there was to be a robot killing mission on that Friday, and because Saul was in charge of the graduation's refreshments, it was a Spartan affair. After an address in which Saul openly wept when describing Yoshimi's brilliance, and after his reading of Shakespeare's Sonnet 28, and the lyrics to Sweet Child of Mine by Guns N' Roses, <laughs> during which his crime broke afresh on the line, where do we go now? The crocodiles cracked open cans of generic beer and plainly spoke about the upcoming mission. Saul himself took stencil and Yoshimi aside. You two have been a great class, best in a long time. I could even see two Karakos like you turning the tide in the robot war. Oh, me too, Stencil said. Yoshimi looked beautiful and fresh in her new official Karakto uniform, strands of her black hair floating, floating in the ambient breeze and holding the sunlight like gilding. She did not speak. You guys heard about the mission on Friday? Should be good. Stencil agreed and both men nodded at Yoshimi. Their conversation continued like this, the two men telling Yoshimi things they desperately wanted her to believe about them, like, I like to kill robots because I am brave and suitable, or, now and then when I see her face, it takes me away to that special place, and if I stay too long, I'll probably break down and cry. <laughs> Yoshimi was not interested, and when she could politely leave, she did. Although it was daytime, Yoshimi went to the salt marshes. She crawled through the reeds to conceal herself, for both the Karato guards and the robots that undoubtedly patrolled the place during the day, then shimmied up and oiled there. Her thin shape was indistinguishable in its profile and she looked off towards the distant robot city. I wonder what they do there, she thought. Are all of the robots like 888? Of course, Yoshimi had seen robots do bad things, but most of the images that she could conjure were not robots at all, but public service announcements about them. The Inhuman Menace series was famous, and the most recent one that she had seen that morning, with a close-up of a robot's demonic, rusty-toothed face, and the words, steel doesn't feel, emblazoned overhead, promised to be so as well. I don't know anything, she thought. From the top of the dare, Yoshimi could see an old wildcatter shelter, concealed between dwarf palms and rusty cast-off machinery, until that moment, she did not understand what she was going to do. But then it went off like a stick of dynamite burning away in her heart. And she shimmied back down the oil there and slipped away. Six hours later, when night was fully upon Long Beach, Yoshimi belly crawled back into the reeds. She made it quickly to the spot where she knew the robot would be standing. He was waiting for her, holding a rough hewn eucalyptus branch as an offering. Yoshimi accepted and began dragging him towards the wildcatter shelter, and the robot followed. The salt marshes were quiet, unusually so, as if thoughts and eyes on both sides of the war had turned away from the other. Because Yoshimi was excited, she did not hear the two figures creeping behind her and the robot. When they got to the shelter, Yoshimi kicked the old worm-eaten door in. It looked like the place had been used by kids in the day before the war. Old bottled littered plants labeled bleached and peeling. It smelled like the ocean and oil and old wood. Yoshimi turned to the robot and took a deep breath. In a mood, Yoshimi had learned about sex the way everyone does, reconstructing secrets with rumors. She had formed her likely scenario. Two people connected their bodies in some event that lasted anywhere from six to 14 hours and when finished, were more in love than before. This scene was warped by Dr. Adekai's matter-of-fact description of sex during a health class. It was shorter, messier, and of a depressingly certain purpose. But now she understood, and from such a strange source. It reaffirmed to Yoshimi that something about her experience with the robot was miraculous. What would probably happen now is the 14-hour experience. A cross between a concert, church, a massage, and a tornado. Yoshimi reached out to touch the robot's cheek panel. For a moment, his purple eyes glowed. Then he cut her hand off. It was a spring-loaded limb shear that had popped out from under the mirror on his chest. Yoshimi didn't react for a moment. It was a good limb shear and didn't hurt much at first. And before she even began to bleed, Shock hit Yoshimi like a heat wave. 
She screamed. Outside, Stencil and Stahl heard Yoshimi screaming. They jumped out of the reeds and recoiled from each other because neither had known the other was there, and then burst through the door of the wildcatter's shelter. They saw Yoshimi lying on the floor bleeding, the slickness of her muscle and the shock of her exposed hewn bone. Stahl went crazy, and in a flurry of limbs and wood, he clubbed the robot to pieces with a baseball bat he'd been carrying. Stencil's shock broke as the robot's eyes went into a disco flash, and he attacked also, stomping the ruined machine as it convulsed and vomited hydraulic fluid out of its various apertures. When the robot was finally still, the two men turned to Yoshimi. Her breathing was weak, and blood surrounded her, creeping towards their feet, but she was still alive. They slid and slipped in her blood while they tourniqueted her limbs and lifted her and left the wildcatter shelter. They splashed through the reed beds and made it out of the salt marsh quickly, each believing Yoshimi would die before she got to safety. She didn't. Yoshimi made it to the Karato Hospital, where they had seen countless evil amputations. The Karatos collected and stood in the upholstered lobby, quiet with shock, developing rumors. How could it be that a new Karata, just graduated, would even be in the salt marshes? And why was she by herself? Is it possible that her heroism, like her natural talent, bordered on the ridiculous? Perhaps she'd gone alone to wage a singular, passionate war, something that each Karato in the circle agreed that they wanted to do their whole lives. Stencil and Stahl stood and listened. Neither said anything as the stories got better and better. Yoshimi fought, flipped, flew. Yoshimi, the teenage hero, and the sense they got the impression that Stencil was waiting to follow his lead. But still, he was quiet. What could he say? He wasn't even sure what he'd seen. Finally, Stencil clarified it. When he could no longer wait for Stahl, he told the story in an arterial rush of impressions. Yoshimi had fractured minds. Yoshimi had led the evil robot to the wildcatter shelter for some incomprehensible, probably impure reasons. Yoshimi had accepted a gift from the robot. What was it? One of the Karatos asked. A eucalyptus branch. The team moved. Yoshimi could hear the noise from her room. A nurse stood by her bed and flipped the pages of a thick prosthetics catalog. Yoshimi, still a bit drugged, allowed herself to fancy that she could move the pages of the catalog with her mind. She synchronized her will and the nurse's plump hand in order to not come up against the reality of it, which was, of course, that her mind's ability to affect the world was shorter by two hands and two feet. That night, Wexford Stahl went home and got drunk. He forced a happy face for his boa, but it didn't last. And in a fit of rage and despair that he neither expected nor understood, he strangled a bow constrictor and hung himself with his carcass. It wasn't just the tragedy of Yoshimi that brought it on. It wasn't just a bat that leaned against his glass wall, slipping again and again because of the, because of the hydraulic fluid that coated it, which had been meant as a gift for Yoshimi. Before the giving of which he would kneel, and describe a time in which men and women played games and obsessed over them, measuring and analyzing them in a way reserved in the present day for robots and their evil plans. It wasn't just the innocent black eyes of his boa. Bruce was his name, either. Stahl suffered the realization that the robot war would change. One day the robots would develop knife shooters or flamethrowers, and Kratos would start to carry guns. The robots would develop armor, and the Karatos would invent radiation weapons that would marble metal where it stood. The robots would begin to fly and produce other robots that looked like babies and ticked like bombs. And Karatos, now diffused of all karate grace and just simple soldiers, would dust off the nuclear weapons in the oil-bearing basements of downtown Long Beach. Amidst all tired. Stencil, by contrast, thrived. After Stahl's rectified suicide, the young Karako rose fast, always fighting the specter of his ex-classmate's perverse betrayal. He was known for his competent, if unimaginative, grasshopper style, and he retired at the apex of his pay grade, bought a speedboat, and disappeared.
if you're much of a historian, you know that 15 years after Stahl's suicide and just before Stencil's retirement, Bigfoot monsters descended from the San Bernardino Mountains. They brought with them their ancient imperial ambitions, and after enjoying a brief literary fame, characterized by tell-alls and performance poetry, they attacked the robots. The battle was short. Apparently, they knew something that we did not know, and the once thriving robot city has been reduced to two double-wide mobile homes inhabited by a family of sad, confused robots. The Bigfoot monsters, of course, attacked us shortly after their victory. As of this writing, they are the worst enemy man has yet faced. In recent months, they have led vicious raids on bookstores, and although psychiatrists have had trouble penetrating the motivations of their proto simian minds, I believe it is the memory of the hollowness of literary fame that haunts them. The point here is that if you are in a bookstore now, especially a corporate one, they favor the bathroom facilities and sale displays. Look around. Do you see a man who looks cagey? Is he tall? Does he have shaving cream behind his ear? He is their scout. Find the largest book in the reference section and throw it at him. Run. Scream. You are in danger. <laughs>